Thank you, Tom. It's all true. <laughs> I am tremendously distinguished. And, <laughs> and this is a great honor for you, honestly. <laughs> no, it's, um, it's great to be here. Um, I say that because you have to, don't you? <laughs> what am I going to say? I really wish I wasn't in Dayton this evening. But it is actually great to be here. Uh, I've been in Ohio several times, actually, in uh, other bits, you know, uh, Cleveland and Columbus, but never to Dayton. And uh, it reminds me of home because I'm from England. <laughs> and it's miserable there as well, so. <laughs> which is, of course, why we live in California, which I strongly recommend to all of you. Um, but it is genuinely a pleasure. Uh, I work these days in three different areas, I say. I mean, not geographically, but uh, professionally. I work a lot in education. I always did. Uh, that's my kind of home turf. And uh, I work a lot with businesses these days on uh, things to do with innovation. And I also work with the cultural sector. I always did. Um, Particularly the arts. I wouldn't want to conflate the arts with culture, but the artistic bit of the cultural sector uh, ha has been a big passion of mine for a long time. Uh, I say it because um, it's sometimes you know people read out my entire resume you know, at the beginning of these talks. Um, you know, it's like several pages. I mean, Tom couldn't be bothered, obviously. So you know. The <laughs> <laughs> No, but sometimes people do, and, and I don't mind if they don't, because I get my family to read it to me in the morning over breakfast, you know, so it's, then we discuss all the key bits. But the real thing about it is that I had no idea when I was at school uh, what I would do uh, with my life. I mean, I knew I'd do something with it, and uh, it wasn't that I was um, completely at my wit's end, but I had no idea, really. Uh, I liked at school, I liked French and uh, Latin. It was in high school in Liverpool, in England. I liked French and Latin. Uh, actually, I liked the French teacher, <laughs> Mr. Evans. It's, <laughs> it's a long story, but... Uh, <laughs> but Mr. Evans really impressed me because, firstly, he could speak French which, in my experience, not all French teachers can, <laughs> uh, like proper French. And secondly, he had a French wife, uh, which was intoxicating for us growing up in Liverpool in the 1960s. I mean, we couldn't imagine it. Actually, we could, <laughs> as it turns out. And it's what kept us at school for the final two years. But I loved, I loved Mr. Evans. He was kind of urbane and sophisticated. You know, he used to smoke gitan cigarettes. And he'd had garlic, uh, which was unknown in England when I was a kid. I mean, garlic, I thought it was a drug. I still do, really, <laughs> deep down. But nothing seemed less probable to me growing up than that I would live the life I've had and that one day I'd be in Dayton, Ohio, speaking to you. This was not a plan. Now, I say it because, uh, in my experience, it, this principle is true of everybody. I mean, how many of you here who are uh, in the middle of your working life or later, how many of you planned the life that you've actually had when you were at school? It's not very impressive, is it, really? Um, I mean, I don't mean to say that, well, you have one hand at the front here. I don't mean to say that, that, that nobody has a clue what they're going to do with their lives. It may be that there's a, an area of, of work that you want to move into. It may be that you know you want to be a teacher or you want to be a veterinarian or, or you want to be an engineer or you want to be a homemaker. But this life, these people, the, the places you've been, the people you've uh, come to spend your time with, it's it's not only improbable, it's actually impossible to predict the course of your life. Now, I say this 
because our education systems, in my experience, are based on the exact opposite principle. There are really three principles that drive current systems of education. I say current. Um, it was always the case pretty much since we've had formal systems of education. I should also say, by the way, that um, I am not from America. I don't know if this has yet become clear to you, but, uh, but uh, I, I was born in England, but I live here now. Uh, we moved here 12 years ago. Actually, we moved to Los Angeles thinking we were moving to America. But, uh, <laughs> has anybody here been to Los Angeles? Oh, well, you know what I'm talking about. It's a wonderful place. Uh, there was a great quote from Frank Lloyd Wright who said, if you were to turn the world on its side and shake it, everything loose would end up in Los Angeles. <laughs> and we were, and we did. Somebody asked me at the reception earlier, he said, why did you move to LA? Because uh, I was living in England at the time, and I said, they asked me on the right day. You know, it was the 3rd of January in England. And I had this phone call saying, would you like to come and work in California? We left immediately. I, <laughs> I didn't even ask what the job was. I mean, the, <laughs> the phone's still hanging off the hook at home, and the, the cat's wandering around looking bereft. And, and our two kids, James and Kate, they came with us. You know, they heard we were leaving, and <laughs> they kind of intercepted us at the airport. But when I came to America, we were told all kinds of things. Like, for example, we were told that Americans don't get irony. Have you come across this idea? It's not true. I've traveled the length and breadth of this country. I found no evidence to support this idea that Americans don't get irony. It's simply a cultural myth. It's like the British are reserved. No, we're not. I don't know why people think this. We've invaded every country we've encountered, <laughs> haven't we? We've, we've dominated every culture we've come into contact with. Why you think we're holding back, I have no idea. <laughs> you should let yourself go more. Really? Do you want to see us when we get pushy? Really? <laughs> but I knew that Americans got irony when I came across that legislation that dominates education in America no child left behind. Because whoever thought of that title gets irony, <laughs> don't they? Because this legislation is leaving millions of children behind. Now, I can see that's not a very attractive name for legislation. Millions of children left behind, I can see that. <laughs> What's the plan, Mr. President? Well, we propose to leave millions of children behind. And Here's how it's going to work, and, and it does work. It's a brilliant, brilliantly conceived piece of social suppression. But it wasn't the intention. No Child Left Behind, for those of you who know what I'm talking about, you know, is the dominant legislation that's guided American high school and elementary school education for the past 12 years. Um, it was put together with the very best of intentions. But it doesn't work. I'll tell you in a minute how I know it doesn't work, but I'll tell you, let me tell you why it doesn't work. It doesn't work because the whole approach to education misunderstands how human beings actually operate. Um, I mean, for, I say there are three principles. The first one is this. The current system of education, it's not just true here, by the way, it's true in most parts of the world, is based on conformity. That's the guiding principle. It's uh, promoting what people have in common and encouraging everybody to conform to this conception. Can I ask you, how many of you who've got, how many of you got children? Okay. Um, how many of you have got two children or more? All right. And those of you who haven't got children yet, uh, do you have any friends? <laughs> um, and the rest of you have seen such children. Small people wandering about, haven't you? If you've got two or more children or friends, I will make you a bet, and I'm confident I will win the bet. My bet is, if you've got two or more children or siblings, that they are completely different from each other, aren't they? You would never confuse them, would you? Like, which one are you? Remind me. <laughs> you know, your mother and I are going to introduce some system of color coding, because we're constantly mixing you up. 
the reason I'm confident to win the bet is not because the people you know are different, but because we're all different. One of the key features of human existence is diversity. I don't mean just ethnic diversity or gender diversity. I mean, even within every other variable you can imagine, every single one of us is a unique moment in history. I, was, uh, I did an event a few years ago in Vancouver uh, with the Dalai Lama. It's a fantastic event. It was uh, in Vancouver. It was, it was a peace summit. It was called the Vancouver Peace Summit. They're very good at titles in Vancouver. And the guest of honor was the Dalai Lama. I had to introduce the Dalai Lama. Uh, I mean, it was a tough call for Tom, really, I know. But, uh, but the Dalai Lama, really? I mean, this guy has had such an extraordinary life. And, it, it, and he's the 14th of them. You know, so it's not like he just started. Um, and he's had this um, life at the center of global politics since he was picked up as a child and told he was the Dalai Lama. So I had to introduce him, and I thought, well, how do I do that? What exactly do I say about the Dalai Lama? Uh, and then I realized I didn't have to introduce him. Because I thought anyone whose name starts with the, you know, you've arrived, haven't you, socially? <laughs> really. If you manage to collect the definite article in front of your name, honestly, you're, you're home and dry at most social gatherings. Like, which Dalai Lama are you? That would be the. <laughs> Which pope are you? The. Anyway, he said lots of wonderful things. One of the things he said was, to be born at all is a miracle. So what are you going to do with your life? I thought that was a, I mean, it's a very simple thing to say. And, but it's a very powerful thing to say, because if you think of it, the odds of you being born at all are remarkable. There was a wonderful quote, it's an old proverb actually, that somebody once said, uh, you should never resent growing old. It's a privilege denied to many. And I think that's right. But you know, uh, my brother John is currently doing our family tree uh, in Liverpool, and I, I'm one of seven kids. And he discovered that our eight great-grandparents were all born in Liverpool in the mid-19th century within two miles of each other. That's how they met. They ran into each other in the street. Uh, I mean, you could say, no, this isn't the situation. You know, this is underestimating how things really work. This was the cosmos, you know, which was orchestrating affairs in such a way that these eight soulmates converged at the same point in the space-time continuum that they should meet and procreate and continue the process that led to the miracle that is me. <laughs> it's a way of thinking about it. I don't think so, really. I, th I think they just had lower standards then. <laughs> Frankly, I think, I think people ran into each other in the street and thought, you'll do. You know, <laughs> I can spend my life with you without being constantly embarrassed. This will be fine. <laughs> you see, they didn't have TMZ then, you know, and they or People magazine, or Facebook. You know, they didn't know Angelina Jolie was out there. You know, it wasn't like this wasn't an option. People led very local lives until very recently in human history, very local lives. They didn't go anywhere, really. I mean, they lived within a few miles of where they happened to work and vice versa. It's only really our generation, I mean, I mean, my generation on, the boomers and on, who've moved around so much. So think of your own life. I mean, the. I mean, you know, my eight great-grandparents met, and then my great-grandparents eventually were born, and then my grandparents were born and met, and then completely separate lines, my mother and father were born, and then they ran into each other, and, and there was that night in the pub, you know. <laughs> and here I am. And when I think of the odds of it happening, they're pretty astronomical, you know, the odds against it happening. But the same is true of you. You know, the chances against you being here are remote, and far fewer people make it than, than, uh, than don't make it. So when the Dalai Lama says, to be born at all is a miracle, he's absolutely right. It's, a, it's both miraculous in itself and statistically extraordinary that we're here. What amazes me is how many people fritter their lives away 
um, in a state of kind of general boredom with the whole situation. Uh, I meet people, I'm not saying it's true of you, but I meet people all around the world, you know, who, um, who don't enjoy the lives they live particularly, they just get on with it and wait for the weekend. I'll come back to that in a minute, but, but the point I just want to make here is that everybody's life is unique and different. Nobody has ever had your resume before in the whole of human history, and nobody ever will again. Diversity is the cornerstone of human flourishing. Can I ask you, by the way, how many human beings do you think there have been since the dawn of time? Let me give you uh, a, a kind of some boundaries here. I'm talking about modern human beings, like behavioral modern human beings like us. I'm not talking about prehistoric creatures who went around on their knuckles, you know, and kind of grunting. Um, I'm talking about modern human beings like us, you know, with attractive profiles <laughs> and a sense of irony, you know. So <laughs> how many of us do you think were thought to have evolved? I mean, estimates vary, but maybe 150, 100, between 100 and 200,000 years ago. So let's say 150,000 years. We've been around. Um, how many of us do you think there have been altogether? Shout a number out. Thank you. 20 billion, what? 14 billion, yep. Do I hear 20? <laughs> what? Any more at the back? 10 billion, okay. Okay, let me tell you. Nobody knows, all right? <laughs> we have no idea. I mean, we do, but I mean, we, we can't be exact. I mean, people haven't been counting since the dawn of time. They've not been wandering around with calculators, you know, saying, there's four more over here, you know. So. <laughs> no, sorry, it's six, you know. <laughs> but if you Google the question, which is what I did, you'll be taken to various websites, uh, and you'll find that places like the Center for Population Studies and so on have all been making vigorous attempts to figure this question out by looking at birth rates, epidemic rates, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The figure that people come up with is somewhere between typically 80 and 110 billion. So let's split the difference, as somebody said here at the front. Let's say it's 100 billion. That's a figure most people would gather around, but 100 billion. Well, the thing is, I mean, it's a huge number. It's hard to get your head around it. But of those 100 billion, every single life is different. And it's different for a reason I'll come on to. But the fact is that you don't get your resume with your birth certificate. You create your life out of whether or not you discover your own talents, your abilities, and your own possibilities. The problem with the education system currently is it's based on conformity. It's based on people uh, being asked if they can do particular things. One of, the th one of the problems that lies at the heart of current forms of education is an obsession with academic ability. Um, now, I say this advisedly because academic ability is very important, but there's a terrible tendency to confuse it with intelligence in general. Academic ability is the capacity to form certain sorts of logical proposition, to, uh, to engage what's called propositional knowledge, uh, the kind of thing that's often best put into words or certain types of uh, mathematics. But there's so much more to human intelligence than that. You know, if that's all we had, most of human culture would never have happened. I mean, if you, all you had was academic ability, you couldn't have got out of bed this morning. In fact, there wouldn't have been a bed for you to get out of because nobody could have made one. I mean, you could have written about the possibility of one, but nobody could have actually constructed the thing. Human intelligence is wonderfully diverse and multifarious, and we all have very different aptitudes. Again, I'm just going to come back to this in a moment. So the first principle, I think, that our education systems uh, counteract is the principle of diversity. It's why, by the way, so many brilliant people pass through the whole of their education thinking they're not, or so many people leave education thinking they're not smart at all, because their mind works in a different way to the one it's required to work in order to get through the education system. And I say this not in criticism of, of America, it's true generally of predominantly Western-oriented Western, -oriented Western uh, education systems. So if you happen to be good at things other than uh, the requirements of a conventional academic curriculum, you may well conclude that you're just not very smart, when in fact you may be deeply smart, but you've just not discovered how yet. 